Hello everyone, welcome to the next video in my series about showing off uh, cool CLI tools I use. In this video we're going to go over a task runner that I use, which is a bit of an alternative to make. It's called task or go task. Um, and it's a task runner or build tool similar to make or just if you've used either of them. And essentially uh, what it really lets us do is improve our developer experience uh, by having to memorize fewer commands. And we'll see that in just a second. Think of the poor developers, right? Uh, so many things to remember. Let's make it uh, one, one fewer. So for example, rather than having to remember that uh, the command to run unit tests, I can just do something like task test unit. And if I have a target in, in our task file, which we'll take a look at in just a second, uh, it will execute this. And one cool thing about this is if you work across multiple projects, multiple languages, you can have these generic targets and not really have to necessarily worry about what's happening under the hood or memorize, memorize what's happening under the hood. So if you're doing front end code and then going to back end, uh, you don't have to, you know, swap between like Jest and Go or um, PyTest or whatever you may be using. And then behind the scenes, I mean, it, it, the task will show you the command it runs, but behind the scenes, it might look something like this. I recently found this tool, uh, Go Test Sum, which I think is a better uh, visualization of what Go Test is doing, uh, especially when tests failed. I personally found this a lot easier to follow. But here's an example of how I might be running my unit tests. Um, in Go for some of my Go projects, um, and I don't have to necessarily worry about all the details, which is quite nice. In our tasks file, it might look like this. Um, so we can see we've defined a target here, we've given it a description and the command to run. And uh, task files are pretty flexible. I, I probably only use like maybe 10, 15% of the features they provide, but uh, they have great docs um, and they're really cool um, in terms of uh, what you can do. So let's get started. Let's take a look at how you can install uh, task files. Um, they recommend using this curl script, um, which will install it in the correct location and handle all the other stuff that you need. Um, because it's built in Go, it compiles down to a single static binary, so it doesn't need any other dependencies. You could do Go install, but um, you might not get the stable version, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the way they recommend. Of course, um, because this is one of my videos, as I always say, um, you can also, you know, use uh, something like Nick Shell uh, to to you know create this temporary shell where you have um, this task file on Nix. The package is called Go Task, and then you can just do task, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or what I do, and we'll take a look at in a demo in a second, is I install it in my dev shell, so it becomes like a development dependency. Um, to, to improve that kind of developer experience, you can just go and um, have that readily available when you go work on one of my projects. You don't necessarily have to worry about having it globally installed, though, of course, I use it so much I do have it globally installed. But that doesn't really matter how you go about installing it. Again, uh, the docs are pretty good and uh, we'll show you how to install it on your distribution or OS. Then uh, in your project, let's create a task file.yaml. So in this case, I might open it in NeoVim. Let's have a look what an example task file might look like. So this is for <clears throat> this is a simplified version for my Go projects or one of my Go projects, Bantabus, which I, 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 I've done a devlog for. You can find more details about that if you would like on this channel. But let's just take a look at two targets we've got here. We've got dev which uh, essentially all that's doing is it's just starting my application because it's is serving a front end. I'm using air, which will uh, auto reload, live reload our application. So when there's change, changes in certain files that just reload the application rather than me needing to run, uh, you know, build the binary or run the binary again and again and again. It's pretty cool and it will do some other stuff. It will run um, some other stuff to generate some code to make sure code is up to date as well. Uh, template, uh, templates, etc., etc. So th there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but I just have to do task dev or anyone working in this project just has to do ta task dev. As you can see, we're also passing an environment variable. So we get uh, debug level logs because, you know, we're often going to be debugging the application. So we want more logging or more, more verbose logging. Then let's take a look at the lint job. Um, again, relatively straightforward. We're just running Golang CI lint run. You'll see this CLI args 
a bit. Um, we'll take a look in the demo exactly what that means, but that just basically means we can pass extra arguments. So we can do like task lint and then pass extra arguments if you want to this, which is pretty nice. So taking a look at an example, you can see the dash dash fix here. That would be the CLI args. So if we wanted to pass extra arguments specifically to go lang CI lint, that's one way we could do it. Uh, note the two dashes before. Um, this lets us know that these aren't arguments for the task job itself or the task C uh, CLI tool. This is specifically args we want it passed. So everything after those two hyphens will be passed to the Golang CI lint. So we could pass other arguments if we wanted to as well. Again, I think this is very similar to what you can do in make files as well. So not anything new. And I assume you can do the same in just. And uh, of course, it's YAML. So uh, sometimes, you know, you, you will feel, uh, especially if you're in the DevOps world, a bit more like a YAML engineer, uh, just working with YAML all the time. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but just, you know, uh, some people really like YAML, others don't. I, I, I personally don't mind it. Um, I think the syntax is a little bit easier for me, for me personally to read than make files. Hence, I moved over uh, from using make files, which I was using for a couple of years uh, until I found out about task files at um, a Go meetup I went to. And then if we have a look at what our terminal might look like, so we can list all of the jobs available. So this is again for uh, my Bantabus project. You can see here, I'm listing all the targets we have. So we have a bunch of targets, a bunch of stuff. Um, I also use these targets in CI. So um, essentially what I'm running locally will be closer to what I'm running in CI as well. Um, so sometimes some of these targets might seem a bit superfluous. I probably am not going to be publishing Docker images from my CLI but, or from my terminal, but I could. And uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, since I've discovered task files, as I was saying, I haven't really felt the need to um, really go back to make. Again, nothing wrong with make. Perfectly good tool. I used it for many years, particularly with Python. Um, in fact, we still use it at um, my place of work as well. So yeah, perfectly good, but just a funny little meme. <laughs> Until I find the next tool that I like. Uh, that, that's probably one of the slight issues I do have. I do like uh, new shiny toys and I'm like, oh, that's a cool new tool. Uh, but anyways, that's neither here nor there. Let's take a look at some of the features of task files. Like what separates them from other tools. So one of the things we can do is create this kind of global uh, task file in our home directory. And then uh, when we're working on our projects, uh, which are often going to be in our home directory, uh, like for example, I put mine in home projects, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we can then reference this task file by doing um, task with a G uh, argument passed to it, and it will reference that global task file. And particularly if you're at, say, work, or you have lots of projects and um, they're sharing similar targets, um, or, or it's the same, let's say you, you predominantly work on Go projects, you can just have this one global task file and reference it there rather than having in every project, because that can become a bit of a pain when you want to update it within the project. You have to then update every project, and especially if you're doing, say, like microservices at work, you might have 20, 30 microservices you're uh, jumping between, and maybe you might have, I don't know, collectively uh, in the company, you might have 100 microservices, or even if you have like 40 microservices, it becomes starts to become a bit of a maintenance pain. Not so much, I think, if you're working on personal projects and stuff, but um, yeah, your task file will likely evolve, and if you can update in one place, that's probably easier for you. So that's something... I think it's quite cool um, and definitely something I, I will would leverage or look at leveraging if we can. Some other cool features, uh, you could include other task files. So if you want to break down your task file rather than having one massive task file, uh, you can reference other task files um, with different names uh, using this include syntax, which is pretty cool. Um, makes it a bit more modular, a bit more um, easy to easy to access or easy to read rather. One of the really cool feature we can use is um, task dependencies. And essentially what that means is, in this case, what we're saying is uh, the build task is dependent on the assets class, uh, sorry, uh, assets task even. Uh, and what that means is it will uh, 
run this uh, task before it runs the commands. So before it builds our binary, it will run uh, generate these assets here. So if we take a look at that job a little bit closer, we can see it's just minifying some JavaScript. Um, we provide it with the sources and generates because depending on uh, which method you're using with task files, it will it can determine with these sources and generates if it should uh, regenerate this uh, bundle.js. Um, with the sources, it will be if any of the sources have changed using checksums uh, and with generates, it checks the timestamp um, and if it needs to regenerate that file. You can go look at the docs for, for more details there. It's pretty nice. Um, uh, they're pretty good. But yeah, that's that's basically it. So we'll run this assets job first and we're providing source and generate so we don't need to unnecessarily run this and slow down our development time, um, which even by a couple of seconds can be annoying if you need to do it quite often. Um, and then it'll go back and run that go build command above, which is really nice. All right, let's take a look at demo. Uh, in this case, what I'm going to do is show you how I might use it uh, for one of my projects. So let's go over to Bantabus uh, using Zoxide to do that, by the way. Uh, I'll do another video in uh, Durham and some of the other stuff, but Durham is uh, loading some stuff automatically. So I have a bunch of tools available. So I can do oops, task uh, list, uh, list all my tasks here. And then we could do like task dev, which will start. It's going to fail because it's actually running on a different port and I've got all this other rubbish here because I've been playing around with some OTL open telemetry stuff but we could do like generate sqlc and it will generate that uh, I can do tab to complete when I don't know what's going on as in I don't know what commands I want to run and as you can see as I said before it is letting us know what it's running which is quite nice um, so we can do just unit for example I uh, run all the unit tests, and this is an example of the Go test sum I was talking about earlier. Any of you people uh, using Go, um, this is a nice little runner here. But it doesn't really matter. So that's, that's kind of roughly how it works. Uh, and I guess if I show you my GitLab uh, YAML file, you can see um, that for lots of the jobs here, we will be using these task files here, um, passing some extra commands. So we can generate some uh, coverage reports for CI so I can get uh, details about coverage. But roughly, it's, it's basically the same as what I'm, what I'm running locally, which is quite nice. Again, I'll do a deeper dive in probably one of my dev vlogs for Bantabus about how I've set this up and why I've set up and the specific way. I and then one final <laughs> jab at make files. I, I, I think um, so, some people probably may be still wondering why not make files or just files. Uh, to be honest, uh, with just, it's just because I discovered task files first and it, they did what I needed to do. With make files, it was just I found the syntax a little bit difficult to read at times. Uh, again, don't get me wrong, perfectly good. If you like make files, stick with them. Um, I just think task files um, or task or go task provides a whole lot of flexibility and it's easier to read, like you don't need to put phonies everywhere, for example, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think it makes your dependencies more clear uh, between jobs and stuff like that. Um, I just think generally it's cleaner, personally speaking. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any feedback or questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. And again, I don't know if you guys know, but I use Nix, by the way. <laughs>